Okay, we're going to get going. Uh, welcome to the uh, session, special session on uh, extreme aquatic ecosystems and their astrobiological relevance, a session in honor of Robert Orton Jr. Um, I'm going to just briefly remind speakers, we're going to have, we have a 15 minute slot and we've got the um, timer set to flash at to 12 minutes, or 11 <coughs> minutes, I forgot. 12, 12. 12. Thank you, Larry. And then it's, uh, it's going to go red at 14, so um, we're going to try and keep on time. Um, also, a few program changes at 11.15, uh, we have a replacement, Natalie Cabral couldn't be here, so uh, Kaylin Colley is going to talk about uh, Lake Vida. And then at 3.15, um, Sally McIntyre couldn't be here, and John Prisky is going to talk to us about uh, wizard uh, in the Antarctic. So, uh, glad we could get those filled in. All right, so uh, this session is about extreme aquatic ecosystems, and uh, many of the talks are uh, from the dry valleys, which a lot of people are familiar with, but they're not all from the dry valleys, and, and many are going to be connected to uh, linking these e ecosystems to um, um, to planetary environments. And just a, a quick overview of of, uh, of the history of exploration on, on uh, extreme e or, uh, planetary environments like Mars, and Bob Orton was uh, involved in connecting those two places. Uh, and I'm a little nervous because I've got people like Jim Head and Larry Esposito in the crowd. I'm, a, I'm reviewing the space program and they're experts on this, but uh, there was Mariner 4 um, in the mid-60s uh, flew over Mars and took some pictures and found it to be a pretty inhospitable place, dry planet. Um, and based on those results, a guy by the name of uh, Norm Horowitz from JPL uh, was among the first to suggest that the uh, that cold, dry deserts like Antarctica uh, were excellent analogs for Mars. It's based on the dryness. Um, his team went and collected soil samples and uh, did studies on these soil samples, about 500 of them, and deemed many of them uh, sterile. And this was kind of a controversial result. So the soil samples, by the way, if anyone saw Chris McKay's talk last night, he still holds those samples in his freezer on a roof at Ames uh, Research Center. Then came Mariner 9. Um, around the early 70s, and this is a picture from uh, a paper by Carl Sagan uh, in Science, and I believe this is the first um, published evidence of, of water on Mars um, in this uh, Sagan et al. paper. And, uh, and this started getting people thinking about, well, it's not a dry planet, it's, it's actually, there was evidence that there's water flowing on Mars. And then <laughs> came uh, the Viking uh, mission in the mid-70s, and, and even more evidence of uh, water on Mars. And then, so people started thinking about um, uh, analogs on Earth, of where you have uh, perhaps you know cold environments that uh, have water as well. And uh, Chris McKay at the time, um, in the in the seventies, was uh, at University of Colorado uh, doing his PhD, and and there was a Mars underground being formed with him and people like Carol Stoker. Um, thinking about, uh, you know, how do we get up to Mars and, and, and find this evidence. Um, and at the same time, Bob Wharton was at uh, Virginia Tech and doing his PhD on, uh, on the Antarctic Dry Valley environments with Doc Simmons and Dale Anderson and other people uh, and going to the Dry Valleys. And, and uh, Chris, if you saw his talk last night, he did a very good job of, of telling the story because he was there. <laughs> I wasn't. But he, uh, he and Bob got together. Bob, <coughs> Bob uh, or Chris became interested in the idea of lakes. He saw a talk by uh, Mike Carr saying there was uh, these dry lake beds on Mars, and Chris became interested in well, how do they how do they uh, not freeze solid? And so, talking to Bob, they worked together on on um, on figuring out the physics of these lakes and, and uh, how these lakes might relate to uh, past uh, aquatic environments on Mars. And so, this was really the first. Um, use of, of uh, the dry valleys as a, as a liquid uh, aquatic environment analog for Mars and it was really uh, developed in concert between these two individuals and, uh, and they went on to write a, uh, many papers on the topic kind of like a Lennon-McCartney team. Um, so at this point I'm going to, Diane's going to take over and, and um, finish up this introduction and, and uh, introduce us to uh, Bob Wharton, who most of you in the room knew. Is 
So um, to start off, there's a strong uh, history of studying the dry valleys at Virginia Polytech where Bob completed his PhD and he uh, connected with some key characters, Doc Simmons, Bruce Parker, who had been looking at these lakes in the dry valleys from a limnological perspective and that's the background that he brought with him when he first got connected with uh, Chris McKay. And uh, then he became a, um, uh, did this research in the dry valleys also with a lakes focus, as Peter said, working on the physics of the lakes and trying to understand them from a different perspective. And uh, in the mid to late 80s, Several groups were working in the Dry Valleys, Barry Lyons. Uh, I heard a talk by Chris McKay at an HEU meeting, and I was so excited to know that there were lakes in Antarctica. I'd always, as a kid, read every ex novel or, or biography and thought this would be a great place to go. So Bob's vision was to take advantage of the opportunity that uh, Polly Penhale is a program manager from NSF laid out for us to uh, put together uh, integrated ecosystem study, not just of the lakes, but of all the different ecosystem components in the dry valleys. So um, he led us to um, put together this integrated <coughs> proposal. Many of you will recognize this cartoon. This is from the first proposal, which was submitted in uh, 1990, and uh, that was a way of thinking about this ecosystem in an integrated manner. And again, here's the map showing all the long-term ecological research sites in the uh, U.S. program. There's 25 right now, so we were aspiring to become one of one of these and be able to continue the record because one reason we were excited to be working together, another reason we were excited to be able to document the changes and the responses that we saw. Um, so when we started out, we had this uh, cartoon where we showed all these different um, fields of science interacting to understand ecosystem change, but each one of these is science is done by people, and one of Bob's great strengths was bringing people together and to share ideas and move ahead. So that, <laughs> turning this into a, a dynamic group that has built a, a, a legacy and moved forward is one of uh, Bob's important achievements. And this is our uh, logo that we uh, still use that was developed from the beginning. And we built upon a network of existing research stations. Um, we have um, <coughs> meteorological stations, soil plots where we look at um, changes over time in the invertebrates that are there. And uh, we have a network of stream gauges. So this legacy of monitoring goes back to Bob. In fact, I remember my very first season on the ice before the LTR, he asked us to change out the data logger, uh, the, the, the storage module on the data logger on this, uh, for this MET station uh, near New Harbor. And this was in the days before GPS. And I, it was our first season in Antarctica. I remember vividly flying around in uh, the helicopter looking for this, this MET station so we could get out and, and uh, change it up. So again, this uh, vision that Bob had is very much uh, reality now, and it helps us understand, develop concepts that we can use to think about how this system is changing within the gradient or the uh, overall perspective of ecosystems around the world under a changing climate. And uh, I wanted to show you this picture. It's of Wharton Creek, one of the important steps that we needed to take in order to work together in the field was uh, name places. So this is the stream at the 
west end of Lake Chad in the Lake Hor Basin, where um, that that is named after Bob. And I remember talking to Bob about this. And uh, here's our logo for our 20th anniversary. And uh, you can see what we did was we we're still using this cartoon from the first proposal that we submitted that didn't quite cut the mustard, but it stood us in good stead over the last 20 years. And it represents a, a way of thinking about uh, the valleys in an integrated manner, but also uh, based on teamwork and sharing ideas, sharing data. That was a great legacy that uh, Bob uh, set for us. And uh, Bob moved on. He's very, he was ex exceptional at being able to bring people together. He was a visiting senior scientist at JPL. He um, uh, advised NASA. And then he moved on into a very successful administrative career where he was um, vice president for research at the Desert Research Institute. Again, taking his vision for how people can work together to a higher level. He then became a provost and vice president for academic affairs at Idaho State University. And then um, he became president of the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology in Rapid City. And uh, he was in that position for four years and uh, had a tremendous impact and was able to uh, bring this university to a new uh, vision of their role as uh, South Dakota is on the cutting edge of uh, many developments from in terms of biofuels and uh, energy technology and, and mining. And he was uh, clearly a beloved president. Peter and I were there for uh, the memorial uh, where there were hundreds of students who stood in line uh, afterwards in the reception. So uh, he went on to use his abilities to envision science that has served as a, a foundation for our work in a much larger capacities. So uh, uh, we're very fortunate to be a scientific community that he was connected with from the beginning. And uh, here are some other notable achievements, but I think we should, should end here. And uh, I'd like to um, end here and then uh, open up for questions or, or comments about the early days of uh, and either the Antarctic exploration or um, the legacy of the exploration of Mars. So thank you very much. or comments they would like to make at this time? Could you load my slides? Yeah, let's do that. Okay, good. Um, one thing I wanted to explain at, uh, at the beginning for those of you in the room who are scientists is that as a former NASA bureaucrat, this presentation has been certified data free. <laughs> uh, we can work with that. Uh, I did do an abstract, and the rest of it is pretty abstracted. Uh, in my own personal life, I arrived at NASA Ames in 1985 to see what it was like. And I remember these cards getting stolen out of my mailbox in Los Altos Hills and nobody could believe that there was such a thing called the Extraterrestrial Research Division. Uh, but they actually had extraterrestrials there, at least putative ones, and it worked pretty well. This is uh, modeled after Darth Vader's helmet, for those of you who are not having one. Um, and of course, when I got to uh, Ames, I was working on the Control Ecological Life Support System, 
the program kind of amused me at the time because I realized that nobody working in it actually wanted to provide a life support system for anybody. Uh, and it was an in considered to be an interesting scientific problem uh, which might not be solvable. Uh, that was a problem at the beginning, but of course, uh, Bob was working there with Mel Abner, Dave Smirnoff, and looking at algal gas exchange reactors. Uh, the problem was is that all the people working in it didn't mind the idea that it was a life support system, but the headquarters people didn't really care. Um, so I worried about that for a while, uh, and later it had devastating consequences. Uh, but space station freedom was coming along, and the idea that you could build a module and pack it full of wheat plants and deal with that. This is called a Himawari. It brings in light uh, from the outside, so it doesn't cost anything. Now, the one thing it doesn't show here are radiators to get rid of the heat caused by bringing in the light. And of course, how to deal with that with uh, fluid flows and other things are why I model life support systems for a while. Um, the timeline was basically early 85, I get to Ames Research Center. November 1991, Bob leaves NASA headquarters. Uh, and in between there, we met a lot of interesting people. Steve Squires, Jim Casting, Don Canfield were uh, postdocs at the same time. Chris McKay had done a miracle and had just been hired by Ames, the first person since Apollo to be hired. Um, and of course, everybody there was living in the Apollo era. There was actually a uh, stainless steel glove box line from the days of life detection from Apollo 11. Um, spring 86, somehow, People said, yeah, you know, would you want to come to headquarters? You know, we, we're out of idiots in Washington. We need a new one. Um, so I said, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. And then Don David Chinsey got excited and said, we need somebody who doesn't know anything about exobiology to run the exobiology program. And I said, well, you know, I'm your man. Um, <laughs> so I went uh, October in 1986. Don bailed out. Two months later, uh, I started to work with solar system exploration because it occurred to me that that might be important for the program. Um, even though Norm Horowitz, who was earlier mentioned, had declared after Viking that Mars was cold, dry, and dead, and always had been. Um, so that was the bag that I got to hold and uh, try to work things out. And unfortunately, they hired me as a civil servant, and Dale Anderson came aboard to help out. Uh, and later, I called Bob to help. Um, there were all sorts of crazy people in the program at the time, and they're all really good. Carl Sagan, Juan Rowe, Leslie Orgel, here's uh, Stanley Miller, some of you have read about him in textbooks. Uh, Lynn Margulis here getting the, Na the uh, Nevada medal, uh, something Bob arranged. And then this guy, Kyle Rose, I had this crazy idea that you could sequence RNA and do something with the data. Uh, what a crazy concept. Um, we also realized that large impacts probably had killed off the dinosaurs, and that was really good for the program at the time. Uh, this is also subtitled A Bad Day in Canada. Um, and of course, in the Quebec, they didn't speak French at the time, so you can talk about this in English. It's OK. Um, Helen Michael, uh, Frank Asaro, and the Alvarezes, um, who uh, looked at clay and gubbio, and uh, that was kind of fun. Um, lots of interesting characters left over from Viking as well. Uh, William Michael was gone. Wolf Wichniak had perished. Uh, Dick Young, however, was probably the most insightful program manager that's ever been in NASA headquarters, having brought Lynn Margulis and um, Carl Loza into the program when NIH and NSF weren't interested in what they did. Uh, of course, we were interested in Earth and Mars, and uh, some very nice things had developed between Earth and Mars, and as Chris McKay might say, they've been spitting at each other for a long time, and we're we'll to have to figure out who came first, uh, and whether or not life on Earth is from Mars, or whether or not life on Mars will be from Earth. Uh, hopefully, we have some ideas. The Viking biology experiments, uh, whether pyrolytic release, or gas exchange, or label release, which is probably the most contentious of the group, although I'm not sure why it should be, other than Gil Levin doesn't uh, think that we should fly it again, we should just award him the prize. Um, Water frost on Mars made it interesting, too. And of course, the implications of having water frost on the surface and strong UV light uh, are only becoming uh, appreciated to this day. And we'll see how that goes. Um, some very interesting things that are possible on Mars, uh, including this slide that Chris McKay used. So Calvin and Hobbes has actually been on the advisory committee for exobiology for a long time. <laughs> and uh, we're hoping that we get this opportunity someday. Uh, but what we didn't know when Viking landed 
uh, and not for seven months after, is that the Earth has got life in all sorts of strange places too. Uh, and so here's Jack Corliss holding a large clam from the Galapagos Rift. Uh, later we found giant tube worms. Polly Penhale helped with all that, thank you Polly. And, uh, and that among other things. Um, right now, if this were being done on a uh, Macintosh, you could hear Jack Corliss seeing the hydrothermal vents for the first time, seeing shimmering water, because he and Jack Edmonds were in the sub together. Uh, and Alvin's got uh, recordings of all your voices if you went down in Alvin. Um, we had some nice exobiology studies that Don David Chemsey, my predecessor, had put in place, whether it was stuff from stars, uh, looking at that in Earth orbit, looking for little green men or big blue women, uh, understanding universal ancestors, and also the evolution of complex and higher organisms and how to kill them off uh, with things from space. Um, and the view of exobiology that John Lomberg put together in 1988 looks a little like this. You, know, you start with the Big Bang and you go towards uh, a good radio show. Uh, and everything in between there is represented somewhere in the exobiology program, uh, including a joint announcement that was pioneered in 1990 uh, between Polly and me. And there was this complaint that all the time NASA wanted to do work in the dry valleys but couldn't get there. And there were people in the NSF that kept on getting bothered by all these NASA guys coming up and saying, hey, can you get me to the dry valleys? And they said, no, we don't have money for that. We decided to get rid of a barrier and put together a joint program uh, on terrestrial limnetic ecosystems in Antarctica. And once that happened, you know, all over was, it was all over but the crying. The penguins left and Chris McKay came into the dry valleys. Uh, among others, <laughs> and a number of people in this room, and I think that that was a really nice uh, initial cooperation that made this all kind of tractable. So NASA money, NSF money supporting this kind of research. Um, at the same time, the Planetary Biology and Chemical Evolution Committee at the uh, National Research Council was putting together this document, and that's where I met Diana Wall for the first time, uh, in a nice committee room in the uh, old place at George Washington University. And uh, that was a useful report. I remember Dale helping out on that as well. And the goals, of course, were to understand um, stuff of life wherever it was found, whether it was uh, you know, at the beginning, the middle, or the end. Uh, and that worked out pretty well. We had some nice new investigators, some of whom uh, have been uh, very successful in their careers. Uh, Chris Chibe is on PCAST. Jerry Joyce has uh, invented life in the test tube. And, Jack Shostak, we actually funded him before he got the Nobel Prize. Uh, usually that was the other way around. If you wanted to work in Origin of Life, you had to have a Nobel Prize to make it legitimate uh, up front. Um, and then this guy was had come up with a whole different group of uh, organisms that were related on Earth uh, and seems to have worked out okay. And so he got his Crayford Prize uh, in the long run. Uh, so exobiology bets were paying off. Uh, we had a good management team. Uh, I was the Stucky, Lynn Griffiths, uh, later Lynn Harper helped out. Gary Coulter um, got the job of running the SETI program. And then Bob was there as a visiting senior scientist. Dick Young, uh, former Viking, was then an advisor on the program. Perry Stebeckis, who had actually worked planetary protection on Mariner 9 way back and still doing it at headquarters. Uh, and then Dale Anderson and Mike Meyer, both who uh, supported the program through Lockheed Martin, and Pat Russell and Ron Dutcher rounded out the team. Bob actually was uh, somebody you could detail to go ahead and do something that you didn't want to do and you knew it would get done. And one of those things was the four symposium on chemical evolution and the origin of life. And uh, Bob uh, basically organized this on behalf of the program and brought in some really good things. So we had a, a wonderful series of debates where somebody like Chris Chival would stand up and say, hey, there's 40,000 tons of cosmic dust coming in every year, can that be important? And Jeff Beta and Stanley Miller stand up and said, no, it couldn't possibly be important. <laughs> because it all goes through a hydrothermal vent. Um, and at the same time, we have uh, Everett Schock standing up and going, hey, hydrothermal vents could make their own organics. Could that be important? They said, no, that couldn't be important. It goes through a hydrothermal vent. And it was very interesting uh, kind of discussions that we had. A lot of people got to know each other and define new ways of working together at those things. So eventually we were able to penetrate the space life sciences, and this is a document that was put out in 1989. And if you look carefully here, you'll see that they're interested in comments and exploration, which is really good 
uh, also nebula. Uh, and so we got the space life sciences to think about going beyond Earth orbit, uh, and even the crazy places like the Beacon Valley uh, and understanding how that worked. Uh, Bob put together a really nice document between uh, NASA and NSF. Um, he learned a little bit about Johnson Space Center contracting when it turned out that the guy who accepted these documents accepted them without two colors being printed on the document, uh, but it was a friend of his, and so he didn't really want to send them back. Uh, so that's why the only version of this that exists is in a nice light blue. Uh, when we're looking at exploration, getting Bob ready to go on off into the uh, what is called the synthesis report, uh, it's just like uh, now. Your Majesty, my voyage will not only forge a new rug to the spices of the East, but also create over 3,000 new jobs. So we're working on that. A lot of glittering exploration reports coming along from the Sally Ride report, on through John Aaron's report to the 90-day study, and finally the synthesis report done on behalf of Vice President Quayle, a very effective uh, engaging politician. Uh, but we did decide to put together the Antarctic Space Analog Program in response. Uh, and of course, its motto is the last place on Earth, the first steps to Mars. And it was a joint NASA-NSF program that worked out pretty well. Here's Bob and an Eagle Scout operating an ROV under the ice and uh, it was capable of telepresence type work. Uh, the Mount Erebus Explorer that uh, didn't do as well as it should have. Uh, and then eventually there's a South Pole greenhouse uh, that was one of the downstream efforts of this program. Um, looking at parallels between the Dry Valley Lakes and exploring Mars were uh, important. Uh, and then of course the Hoare Hut and uh, solar power in the Taylor Valley. And I got a chance to do EVA at the South Pole. Um, ASAP now lives on in NASA's ASTEP program, and here's uh, Andrew Steele and colleagues up at Svalbard. Uh, but we have other things going on uh, all around. And uh, these people have been running the astrobiology and exobiology program uh, since the beginning. This is everybody that there was. Uh, and right now it's Mary Wojtek, so try to give her as much support as possible in a difficult budget environment. Uh, Bob gave me a lot of help. I really appreciated it, and uh, you know, we even pulled Dale out of the water just to make it official. So, <laughs> thanks, Bob. It's very cold there. <laughs> That's the first issue. But actually, there has been uh, there have been a couple of proposals: one to Mars Scout, one to the Discovery, to go ahead and do an ice drill to the polar regions of Mars. And my guess is that we'll get to it eventually. There are some difficult problems associated with power supply uh, and you know being able to operate in that environment. But at some point in time, it's very likely to happen. Um, we don't really understand exactly what it's like to melt through something that has <laughs> CO2 frost and water. Uh, we do know that from time to time you get some really interesting dust explosions. Uh, Phil Christensen and whatnot have taken a look at that. Jim? Phoenix was close. Yeah, Phoenix. Just, okay. yeah. Yeah, just a quick comment on that too. There's a, a lot of information now from the Sherrod instrument, the radar sounder. Uh, and the geomorphology of the mid latitudes, and we see huge amounts of evidence for essentially glaciated terrains where the ice is actually still there. So, in the mid latitudes, we even see tropical mountain glacier deposits that are still there, too. So, it opens up a whole new uh, area of exploration in the mid latitudes to solve some of the technical problems and also get access to the ice. And the ice looks like it's a, uh, 200 million years old or more. So, it's a great opportunity there. So, I think that'll emerge soon, too. Yeah. Viking was baked in an oven. Uh, at 111.7 degrees Celsius, every part for 30 hours. We need to know how to actually sterilize something, to echo Chris McKay's last time um, comments. Most mil-spec parts actually are burned in at 125 degrees Celsius. So if we can go to a spacecraft that can actually live up to its parts, we can go ahead and land any place without worrying about Earth <coughs> contamination too. Um, I think we gotta move on to keep on schedule, so.
<coughs> very much, John. And we should actually feel safe in the room because one former planetary protection officer is leaving, and another former planetary protection officer is coming up. Um, Michael Meyer, whose title I believe is currently <laughs> Mars Chief Scientist at NASA headquarters, and uh, was a former post postdoc of Bob's, and that's where I met him at Desert Research Institute. So go ahead, Mike. Uh, oh, we need your talk. Yeah, that'd be nice. So one of the interesting things with uh, working with Bob Warden is um, we we're both trained psychologists, and uh, we kind of drop using that term because you know we go to a bar and we have a drink, <laughs> we introduce ourselves, and as soon as we tell people we're psychologists, they start telling us their problems. <laughs> so decide that maybe we need a slightly different line of work. <laughs> So one of the things, what I want to do is emphasize a little bit about what the important about the Mars program and certainly how Bob Wharton helped set me and much of the community on the path of using Antarctica and other analogs to help us learn what we could learn about Mars and improve our exploration capabilities. So one of the interesting things is, you know, uh, we, these are real size depictions of Earth, Mars, and the Moon. And one of the obvious things is Mars is smaller. Mars has one hundredth the atmosphere Earth does. Uh, it has one third the gravity, one tenth the mass. These things are important, but that isn't why we're studying Mars. Uh, we're studying Mars because uh, it has a potential. I'll get a little bit to it. One of the things that um, Bob and I did was we seemed to uh, exchange places. When I went to the Desert Research Institute, Bob actually went to headquarters. When I went to headquarters, Bob went to the Desert Research Institute. So we changed places, and it's one of those things that even though we we're very interested in doing similar types of research, I actually was never in the field with them, even though we go to the similar places and that sort of thing. Um, but Bob really put forward the idea that using Antarctica as an analog to help explore, obviously learn about Earth, but also to tell us something about other places. And this particular document is one of the reasons why he went to headquarters and working with John as a visiting scientist. Uh, and that is not only as an analog for looking at uh, microbial life in extreme environments, but also uh, what do you do with astronauts in extreme environments and how you might evolve a system to support them. Uh, this is from the report, and basically, as you just depicted, compared <coughs> to the uh, dry valleys and, and our ice, apparently ice-covered lakes with uh, places that we should go on Mars and study. So one of the reasons why we need to study um, things here on Earth is because even when we get something from Mars, it's not so obvious how we can tell whether or not we have evidence for life. As you might recognize, this is uh, the Mars meteorite that uh, hit the news in 1996, and um, it is still controversial uh, whether or not it actually has evidence for life. And actually, I'd, I'd like to take this opportunity to also to mention that David McKay died just yesterday morning, and he was a tremendous scientist and one of the major proponents of what we could find out from meteorites, and in particular, ALH 84001. Well, even studying things on Earth is not so obvious whether or not you see signs of life. Certainly seeing a pen tells you that life has been around. <laughs> but uh, it is pointing at a crustose lichen. And if you didn't know any better, you would just think that was a salt deposit and never paid any mind. So it is by broadening our horizons here on Earth, looking at extreme environments, that we can actually get a better idea of what the, uh, where to look elsewhere. Mars is important in our minds for several different reasons. Formed the same time as the Earth did with the solar system. Uh, life started on Earth in the first billion years. And when we look at Mars, Mars looks like it was much more benign in the first billion years. Water flowed on the surface. We're not sure what else is going on, but certainly it's warmer and wetter. So one of the things, because Mars does not have plate tectonics today, or may not have ever had it, depending upon who you talk to, most of the surface of Mars is ancient, and because of that, you have ancient rocks there for the picking, and it may have the best record in the solar system of what was going on in the first billion years when life started in our solar system. And so for me, that's a great scientific driver for exploring Mars. It's worked pretty well in using this broader argument of why explore Mars. We had a very we have had a very successful exploration program 
of exploring Mars. And we've learned a lot about the red planet since um, Viking in 76. We learned a lot about its topography. We found reduced carbon in the meteorites. Uh, we do see some evidence of what might have been plate tectonics early on by looking at banding of magnetic fields. Uh, we see modern deposits from water. Uh, because we've had orbiters in place for an extended period of time, we'll be able to monitor the surface of Mars and find places where meteorites have hit and expose ice in the underneath. Jim had just talked about how we were seeing evidence of buried ice in mid-latitudes and even in equatorial sides of equatorial uh, mountains. And uh, also we're coming to the conclusion that Mars, with its changes in obliquity over uh, hundreds of thousands to millions of years, creates a situation where you can deposit ice in uh, non-polar areas. We're also finding evidence of one, there's a fair amount of water. The water inventory on Mars today is actually pretty high. It just happens to be in the form of ice or maybe deep in the subsurface. Um, we see flow features on Mars, and now that we've had rovers on the surface, we actually see in hand chemical evidence, mineralogical evidence, that there's been water on Mars. Water has flowed Mars. It has carried minerals and deposited those minerals. Uh, anywhere from seeing uh, sulfates to also seeing rocks that are conglomerates, indicators of stream flow on Mars. So out of this broad study, we've been able to come to some general conclusions about the planet of how it has evolved. It started as a relatively neutral, somewhat wetter and warmer. Uh, during This is during a period that we see clays uh, deposited, so a, a period of clay <coughs> formation. As the planet starts to dry out, we start seeing minerals such as sulfates being deposited. We see these on the surface. Uh, the planet turning more acidic, and then eventually the planet turns into the cold, dry, desert, acidic <coughs> place that we see today. So if we want to look and see whether a lot Mars could have ever supported life, it looks like ancient Mars is a better place to go. Uh, I want to mention again that the changes in obliquity have afforded deposits of water in places that we wouldn't normally expect looking at Mars today. And one of the consequences of that is that because you have buried ice in mid-latitudes, you also have the potential of a chemical disequilibrium by having ice where it really doesn't belong. So one of the great things is that we've been able to recently send a rover to Mars called Curiosity. This uh, rover is almost 950 kilograms, 10 instruments, uh, fantastically um, set up to explore the surface for a Mars year, which is about two Earth years. And uh, if the survival rate of the Mars exploration rovers are any indication, uh, this rover is going to be there when astronauts get there. So. Um, I'm, now I want to point out a few things that we're learning from Curiosity and where we're going just because in many ways Bob's research and vision has helped set up things of using analogs so that we can study and get to Mars and understand better what we're doing and move on to better and better exploration to discovering whether or not this planet could have ever supported life. So Curiosity was sent to Mars, landed August 5th or 6th, depending upon which coast of the U.S. you were on, and lo and behold, we picked a place that looks like a lake. Um, we see where it landed. Uh, because of our fantastic orbital assets, we see pieces of the process of unpacking the rover and getting it to the surface of the sky crane, which carried the rover, the heat shield, which prevented the whole thing from burning up as it went through the atmosphere and the back shell and parachute to help slow it down as it came through. We even caught an image of the uh, rover and back shell hanging from the parachute and it was, it was zipping through the thin atmosphere of Mars headed toward the surface. One of the other things I can point out is right uh, where the arrow is pointing Curiosity, the retro rockets have blown away the surface dust and so that, whole, that dark area there is actually just further exposed uh, rocks because of the activity of landing. So we landed, we see the north rim of the crater. We're in a crater called Gale Crater next to a mountain called Mount Sharp. Um, here's Mount Sharp, taking one of the first images that we uh, use with the mass camera. Um, is an extremely, I just want to brag a little bit about the whole system. 
to give you an idea, here's a picture taken with the other camera, the mass camera, at the same place, um, except for, you know, obviously uh, blown up a little bit, and give you an idea of the scale. This is a, a, about eight kilometers away, and right there is a boulder circled in red that is the size of the rover that's taking this picture. So uh, this is our destination in the next uh, Mars year, and uh, as you might imagine, it's gonna be a pretty spectacular trip as we go through these mountains going up Mount Sharp. Part of the reason why we picked Mount Sharp is it has chemistry that ha it has clays, it has sulfates, there are in sedimentary layers that we can match up that we see from orbit, so we know that we can unveil the history of Mars as we climb up the mountain. I want to point out some of the instruments on board, some of the spectacular things they do. One is ChemCam. <coughs> this is a laser-induced breakdown spectrometer. It shoots a laser, anything within seven meters. It can vaporize the rock or soil, and out of that, you can do the spectra of it and get the elemental composition. And so this gives you an idea of what it looks like. The first rock that they analyzed was coronation. Lo and behold, it's a basalt. Uh, this is very exciting. In fact, it has a, um, a giant telescope on it. Not giant, but a telescope on it so it can look to see the rock before it takes a shot. And then here we see it took five shots on this rock from which we got the chem chemistry. This is a new instrument for planetary exploration. We're all very excited about it. The uh, science team thinks this is great. The public thinks we're doing something else on board. <laughs> but it works. So, um, extremely capable. There's a camera on the end of the arm, and with that, um, took a self portrait of the rover. Uh, one of the reasons why I went to Gale Crater is uh, within the landing ellipse. There's a high thermal inertia area, and the expectation is, is that high thermal inertia area is, represents some sort of aquatic deposit from an alluvial fan. And lo and behold, we go roving on, and we find conglomerates. We see rounded rocks that are stuck together. Uh, we were jokingly calling it Roman concrete. Uh, but as you can see, the places here on Earth where we find this type of deposit are in riverbeds. So one of the attractions of Gale Crater is it has many features that we're particularly interested in. And just as a note, where we really wanted to go when we planned out this whole mission, landing where we did in Bradbury Landing, the entrance to Mount Sharp to go up the, the slope going through the sedimentary layers and looking at the um, clays and sulfates is actually off to your left and a little bit to the south. But of course, the first thing we do is head in the opposite direction, but why? Because we wanna to go to this area that's labeled Yellowknife Bay because water flows downhill and we suspect that that may be something like a lake bed. What makes Curiosity particularly uh, capable as an exploration tool is it has an analytical laboratory. One of the things it has is an XRD, XRF, X-ray diffraction, X-ray fluorescent. It can do definitive mineralogy. Here's a spectra from the soil. It also has a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer called SAM, which can measure uh, below parts per billion. And here's a soil analysis showing that it does work and we're very looking much to uh, what else it can do. We are now in Yellowknife Bay. We've been there for uh, a pro uh, over 50 sols now. And um, it does look like we thought it would look, and we know that water flows downhill, so we're hoping then if there's any sort of deposits from the whole alluvial fan feature that they may end up here and be worth exploring. And so one of the things that I'm tremendously looking forward to is we drill samples, our first drill sample on another planet, and uh, we're now, perhaps today, I'm, I haven't looked at the logs today, put those samples into the analytical laboratory, and so we have high expectation in the next week or so that we will get our first interior analyses of rocks on Mars. And we're excited because, if you notice, Mars is red, but the, the fines coming from the drill are gray, uh, indicating that they are not oxidized and therefore have the potential of preserving things that we don't find on an oxidized surface. And for that, I'd like to thank Bob for pointing out the relationship between extreme places on Earth 
and the potential of going to other places like Mars to explore how life got started in our solar system. With that, thank you. Isn't this just the first drill sample of a rock? Uh, they drilled on the moon. Okay. Done by a robot. <laughs> All right. well, thanks, and you. Thanks. Uh, okay, so our next speaker, I'm going to introduce my co-collaborator here in uh, in this session. Uh, Diane McKnight is uh, going to talk about uh, the dry valleys. So uh, Mike talked about uh, climate change on Mars. He was thinking about time scales of uh, uh, several billion years. I'm going to bring you back to Earth and think about climate change and life's ability to persist on time scales of decades and, and uh, try to make some connections in terms of what we should be looking for on Mars. Again, uh, we study the long-term <coughs> changes through a monitoring network. The McMurdo Dry Valleys LTR has experienced, this is our 20th year, and it's quite appropriate for us to report back what have we learned from uh, these 20 years of understanding or studying change. Uh, as a background, I'd like to point out that our site, which is focused in Taylor Valley, in the Dry Valleys, is the coldest and driest of the LTER sites in the LTER network. So here's average annual precipitation in centimeters. It's 10 centimeters some most years, and the average temperature is quite cold. One of the themes of our research in terms of the long term is understanding linkages among ecosystem components, glaciers, soils, streams, lakes, and wetlands. Um, there's evidence for all of these environments existing on Mars, and if they exist on Mars, they will be interconnected just as they are in the dry valleys. Uh, this is illustrated with this uh, slide. For those of you who uh, don't know, the ice cover on these lakes is about four to six meters thick, whereas the soils are extremely dry. The streams only flow for six to maybe 12 weeks per year. There are uh, minor features on the landscape, but they can connect the soils and the alpine glaciers to these closed basin lakes. The way the system works is as um, water enters the lakes, the lakes may rise, but then the water balance in the lakes is determined by ablation from the ice cover. So if there's less water coming in, in the streams, the lake level that, to, that doesn't match that ablation loss, the lake levels will fall. As I mentioned earlier, we have a network of um, monitoring sites, primarily in Taylor Valley. The stream gauges, we are at those sites, we measure that stream flow that I just mentioned. Uh, we have sampling that's done on all three of the major lakes in Taylor Valley, and we've recently expanded to several other valleys. We have, a, that's what a limno hole is, how you sample a lake. And uh, we have long-term soil experiments on uh, in several basins in Taylor Valley and also in other places. We uh, are a team of principal investigators and professional uh, research support scientists, postdocs, there's been many graduate students involved over the 20 years, and we work together and stay in, uh, this is a hut, and we sleep in backpacking tents for those of you who aren't uh, familiar with the environment. So we get to know each other by working together in the field and as we're traveling down. So this is a great opportunity to share ideas as we're executing the field <coughs> studies. I pointed out in the last slide the, uh, that we also have monitoring going on in uh, Wright Valley. In fact, I'm going to go back to that. This is the uh, Wright Valley here. This blue line represents the longest river in Antarctica. Uh, it's 32 kilometers long. 
And the New Zealand program began monitoring that stream flow in uh, 1969. So that's the longest record of the environment in this Dry Valleys region. Here's the Van de Weer. And we took over and collaboratively with the New Zealand program the operation of this gauging network uh, beginning with the LTR in 1992. And uh, here's how, uh, what it looks like when it's a normal flow season. Uh, here's the record for this period of the LTR which began in about this window here. Here's the past record of the annual flow in the Onyx River. So this is total annual flow in a 10 to the 6th metered cube, which is that's a fair amount of water. And here's the period of record from the New Zealand program and here's the record that we've studied, and there's been one more high flow year. So people asking me, is it, is there, what's happening in Antarctica? Is it getting warmer? Is there more water? Well, the answer is it's colder and drier, except when it's a lot warmer and wetter. And it's <laughs> <laughs> uh, as, as, as if the average of these years hasn't happened, it hasn't been occurring. It's either one or the other. And so we've been trying to understand this in the context of drivers of change. We, this is showing the ozone during the, the spring over the Antarctic. So we, our study is occurring during this period of the ozone hole. Ozone itself is a greenhouse gas, so the absence of ozone uh, has caused something of a cooling, accounting for these low flows in the Antarctic and uh, also has resulted in changes in the uh, circulation patterns. The polar vortex has become stronger and summer comes later because of a greater temperature differential. And this has fortunately been figured out by very smart uh, atmospheric scientist Susan Solomon and her colleagues. So we know this is uh, a, a driver. So as I was explaining, during these cold periods we've had the lake levels fall, and then when there's warm, warm and sunny conditions in one summer, that lake level decrease, which is shown on this axis here, I should have explained that this is the lake level for Lake Bonnie and Lake Hoare and Lake Frixel in Taylor Valley, that we have these uh, lake level losses are regrouped. And on the next picture here shows you what high flow on the Onyx River looks like. It's, it's a lot of water, 700 cubic feet per second. So that um, is a, as a rapid response. And uh, you may, have, may recall I showed that diagram with the Antarctic and the overlapping red circles and studying ecosystem change. Well, we have advanced to more of a hypothesis about how this system works under uh, varying uh, trends where we've had a warming press, a cooling press, and now we're in this transition period where we have these extreme events and interspersed with the cooling press. And one of our main hypotheses is that the response will be driven by the much greater connection across these landscape components during times of high flow, warm conditions, sunny conditions, movement of material due to water, but also movement of material due to much stronger winds during these summer conditions. So that there's a greater exchange of movement of material. And again, these could be phenomena that would but presumably also be happening on a planet like Mars under varying conditions. But that's what's shown here in this cartoon. You see the moats are bigger and the ice is thinner during these periods of greater connectivity. So we do know from our monitoring record that these changes can drive big ecosystem responses. This is a figure showing uh, primary production in one of the lakes, the east lobe of Lake Bonnie. It was going down and down during the cold period because the ice cover was getting thicker. When the ice gets thicker, that means that there's less 
light the algae studied by phycologist uh, <laughs> uh, need light to grow and then during this high flow event in 2000 the summer of 2001 2002 there was additionally a lot of sediment being carried by the streams into the lakes which further attenuated the light causing the lowest levels of growth of algae that we have seen in our record and then there was a rebound and the rebound we think happened rapidly because of the nutrients that came in with those flows that remained in solution as the sediments that were carried settled out. And you may have noticed in the previous graph of the lake levels that lake, there was one lake that's level was going up and up even if it was cold. Well, that was Lake Bonnie. And here is the camp that was present, uh, the lake shore, and I think this was 2006. And now all these structures have moved, have been removed, and this helicopter pad is gone because the, that lake has continued to rise and rise. And as the lake rises, some of these soils that were isolated from the lake now have been captured and are a source of solutes and nutrients and organisms. That's another example of this idea of connectivity. Um, so here's a cartoon looking close up at this interface of the <coughs> systems. And what's shown here is that in addition to the lakes rising causing greater connectivity and opening up the moats during a warm summer, another response is that the depth to permafrost it increases in a warm sunny summer so that the streams that are flowing down from the glaciers are interacting to a greater extent with that alluvium mobilizing uh, solutes. The phosphorus that's required for life comes from weathering that's occurring where the appetite in the sediments is weathered. So again, this is another example of connectivity and these events structuring the ecosystem. And here's an example of how we studied this in one place where this stream, we call it Worm Herder Creek, named after the soil ecologist who uh, had thought this was primarily a dry soil site. This stream has flown three times in our 20 years of record. And uh, we have another system that we studied by where we actually put in a sandbag wall and directed some water down the a channel. So here's Worm Herder Creek and here's most of the streams that flow all the time. And if we uh, look at the diatoms that are present in the microbial mats in these streams, we see that there is a biotic response on this time scale of 20 years to that flow regime where the species of Ludicola, <coughs> many of which are endemic, dominate the diatom communities as you go to less and less frequent flow. So once we find life on Mars, we'll probably find some community structure that's driven by uh, the occurrence of water. We should look for that. Right, Mike? And uh, I would also point out that we are challenged to envision, as we design this program, for the next 50 to 100 years, what's going to happen? Here's a diagram showing that if it does get warmer and warmer and lake level rise continues, we may uh, see the basins fill and that uh, there may eventually be one big lake that may drain to the sea. Here's our hypothetical projection for the flow in um, the Onyx River. At this point, we think that the ozone hole will be remediated, ameliorated, and it'll be warmer and warmer, so there'll be more flow, but it'll still be Antarctica, and so the duration of the summer won't go, won't change. And uh, we're now trying to study how the, what controls these high flow events and have some evidence that maybe the persistence of the ozone into the summer is a factor. So. We, are, we execute this program every year, and we always are wondering, will this be another year like this or like this? 
So, but we use this to understand a larger connection across these ecosystem components. And I'm sure there's <coughs> ecosystem components on Mars. And with that, Well, certainly uh, the thermokarst response in the much greater flux of sediment as a result of thermokarst is another example. And the changes in gas flux from the tundra is another example of connections between the terrestrial landscape and the overlying uh, atmosphere. So uh, I agree, I think there's a lot of analogs. And also the connections <coughs> between the oceans, the Pacific and the Atlantic now. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, our next speaker is uh, one of the world's best known planetary scientists, and I'm really glad he came. Uh, Jim Head is going to give a talk on uh, work in the McMurdo Dry Valleys. I was talking about the history of planetary science. Jim was actually a project scientist on the Viking mission and Apollo, I believe, as well. So uh, I'm glad, hopefully, I did a good job of covering that. Um, <laughs> and so Jim's going to talk to us about his work uh, with Dave Marchant and others. Thank you very much, and it's a real honor to be here. Indeed, I've been in planetary science since dinosaurs roamed the Earth. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say you were 10 then, right? Yes, I was 10 then, somewhere in junior high school or something like that. In any case, this is really an incredible time to get some perspective on what Bob Borden's legacy is, and you can see it throughout the previous talks, and I want to share with you some of the kinds of things that we're looking at in terms of uh, not just the legacy as we see it, but what's going on in the future. So if we don't understand the climate of the Earth, we don't know, in fact, what's going to happen in the future. So the key to understanding future change is indeed to understand the past. And as a few people have pointed out already, it's difficult to understand the past on the Earth because, in fact, much of the record is gone. Fortunately, on Mars, we have another comparison to make. Uh, we can study the climate history of Mars and compare it to the Earth. And we have a record that's just unbelievable in terms of its historical consequence and length. So if we take a look at the characteristics of the climate record on the Earth and Mars, the Earth has, of course, active weathering, plate tectonics, constantly evolving topography, uh, oceans, a huge buffering effect, uh, and also atmospheric surface thermal coupling. On the other hand, when we take a look at Mars, it's quite different. Uh, it's ultra-slow weather, no plate tectonics, topographic stability over long periods of time, no oceans, at least at the present. Two times in the past, there were probably standing bodies of water in the northern lowlands. And indeed, atmospheric surface thermal decoupling at the present time, which means that the incident solar radiation is a function of latitude, and it doesn't get varied by, in fact, uh, coupling with the atmosphere in any substantial way. On the other hand, this is the way Mars is now. And when we look in the past, we see these valley networks, which is, of course, the kind of holy grail for a warm, wet, early Mars. You've heard about this many times. And indeed, uh, this has been the uh, search since Carl Sagan's uh, early uh, report on this in science. And in fact, it's been something we've been trying to figure out for, for many, many decades. Right now, Mars is a hyper-arid, hypothermal desert. That ought to sound familiar to all of you who've worked in Antarctica. That's pretty much what's going on here. Uh, and that's why, in fact, as Bob uh, concluded years ago, that the, the analogs are really, really critically important. So when we take a look at this, then, what is going on today? We can look at the geological record of Mars. It's divided up into three major eras, Amazonian, Hesperian, and Joachim. For the last three billion years, Mars has essentially been a hyper-arid, hypothermal desert, much like Antarctica. We see lots of evidence for glaciation. I mentioned a little earlier, tropical mountain glaciers, 170,000 square kilometers, one of them on one of the mountainsides. Unbelievable drop moraines, et cetera, all the things you in Antarctica are very familiar with in terms of uh, glacial and periglacial phenomena. On the other hand, when we move back into the past, between three and a half and then into four billion years, things change radically, okay? We see things here, evidence of volcanism, huge outflow channels, not from rain, not from surface meltwater, but coming up from the groundwater. How do you do that? How do you get water out of the ground to create these huge floods? And indeed, when we get back here, we see, in fact, the warm, wet early Mars evidence with these extensive valley networks. This is really exciting because it says something happened in early history that made Mars much more Earth-like than, in fact, we see uh, today, absolutely today, okay? So one of the other ways to look at this is to look at the hydrological system and cycle. What does the hydrological system and cycle look like? If we take a plot from the South Pole to the North Pole, a sort of cross-section of the planet, and we think about today, on the surface, it's a cold, hyper-arid desert, much like Antarctic Dry Valleys, okay? 
At this time, there's a low geothermal heat flux, and indeed we have a global cryosphere. Okay, so this is a thick cryosphere measured in kilometers, in fact, many kilometers towards the poles. All the kind of activity we see is uh, atmospheric water vapor and, in fact, CO2 circulating between the polar caps, the regolith, et cetera, as a function of seasonal changes as well as longer term obliquity, eccentricity, and essentially precession changes. On the other hand, in the Noachia, in the first period, we have a higher geothermal flux. We think it's warmer and wetter because we see these surface features, and in fact, many people think that the system is vertically integrated. That is a vertically integrated hydrological system and cycle, just like we see in temperate areas on the Earth today. In contrast to the horizontally stratified system that's characterized Mars for the last three billion years. So what is going on here? How do we test these ideas? How do we find out what's going on here? Uh, indeed, we see lots of geomorphic evidence for lots of surface water flowing across uh, and ponding on the surface. And indeed, when we look, in fact, the mineralogical record, another major thing from the Mars Exploration Program, uh, from the work of Jean-Pierre Bibering, uh, looking with Omega from ESA spacecraft in orbit around Mars, as well as uh, US spacecraft in orbit around Mars and other international spacecraft, we see, in fact, a period in which very Antarctic-like weathering is occurring for most of this period of time. But when we look back at the early history, <clears throat> in fact, we see phyllosilicates, water, linking and interacting with rock, basaltic rock, et cetera, to produce clays. What's the question? A warm, wet, early Mars. How do you do that if you don't have that? And then, as was pointed out earlier, transition with sulfates to this period of Antarctic-like Mars for the last three billion years. Indeed, when we take a look at the geomorphology, it's stunning. These valley network systems are just unbelievable. You can see them coming off the side of this mountain here and, in fact, ponding in this local area here and flowing out. And when we take a look at these, we map them all over the surface of the planet, our, our group at Brown, as well as many other people. Uh, here's valley network systems, and you can see here outlined hundreds of kilometers across the surface, in fact, thousands of kilometers, uh, all over the surface of, of Mars. And when we plot these and the global distribution, uh, as shown here, all these little blue lines represent these valley network systems. So how could it not be warm and wet? How could there not be major aspects of rainfall uh, to, in fact, produce these things? Well, what are these red dots that we see here? These are all open basin lakes, and there's another equal number of closed basin lakes. When we take a look at these in detail, in fact, they're quite intriguing. This uh, uh, example here, for example, is an open basin lake, which means that a channel flows in, uh, the basin fills up, usually an impact crater, and then it flows out the other side, as opposed to closed basin lakes as we define them on Mars, where essentially there is no outlet channel. Uh, so what's going on here? What kind of things do we see here? Hundreds of these things. In fact, this was in 2008. Uh, we now have about 260 or so of these open basin lakes. And when we look at the characteristics of these, let's tune on this one right here at relatively uh, low latitudes. And that one is, in fact, the Jezero Crater, Jezero Crater, open basin lake. So what are we looking at here? Here we are at, on the rim of one of the big impact basins. If we take a look from here and look in this direction, that's what we see. Here's the rim of the basin. Here's a crater. And you can see these channels coming across the surface and ending up in deltas in the interior here and an outlet channel right here. Here's a map view of this. And you can see the two deltas coming uh, from these channels. And then, of course, the filling of the, uh, the basin itself, uh, about 40 kilometers across, and then outflow here. We can even define from the topography the watershed, and we can actually look at the origin of the materials coming into the basin, and with the great data we have from NASA and international spacecraft, we can actually look at the mineralogy of the deposits in these deltas. And since we're in New Orleans, I'll show this one picture here of actual scroll bars we can see in these deltas. It's like unbelievable, okay? Beautiful images, 30 centimeter resolution, and hyperspectral, essentially, uh, data which we can look at the mineralogy. Well, one of the things we find here is that the mineralogy of phyllosilicates is not happening in the lakes itself. It's being eroded from somewhere else and being brought in. So that's a little worrisome in the sense that many of these large impact craters have excavated down deep and brought up material which seems to be eroding and being transported into these lakes. It's not the conditions when the lake is forming that are making the phyllosilicates. Rather, it appears to be excavation of hydrothermally altered material which is then being transported by this water. Well, that's a little bit more complicated than we thought before, but let's go back and look at the characteristics of these things here. It raises the question of whether we, in fact, have a warm, wet, early Mars in the way we'd love to see it, which is kind of like beach balls, cabanas, and kind of like, you know, life teeming across the surface. Part of the problem here is that, in fact, we need a warm, we have a, uh, essentially a, uh, 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 an environment in early Mars in which 
We see no evidence for CO2 deposits that might represent a collapse of an atmosphere. Uh, it's a faint young sun, which is a big problem because, in fact, you need the radiation, solar radiation, to, in fact, raise the temperatures. And it's been very, very difficult to produce, ge uh, produce climate models which can, in fact, bring things up to the melting temperature. It's always been difficult to create these climate models. In the last couple of years, we've been working with our colleagues at the Laboratory for Dynamic Meteorology in Paris, Francois Forger and Robin Wordsworth, and in a couple of papers that have just been published in ICRIS, we were able to reproduce, essentially, a very, very good and robust climate model for early Mars, which included cloud microphysics, CO2 microphysics, et cetera, considerably improved from before. What this shows is that, in fact, the surface of Mars uh, in these times, uh, the atmosphere is thick enough that in, in excess of a few tens of millibars, maybe up to 500 millibars, so that what you get is atmospheric coupling uh, of solar radiation to the surface. This completely changes the environment from what we see today. And if you take a look here, it will give you uh, essentially a adi adiabatic cooling effect, which takes the water vapor, moves it to high latitudes, where it in fa high altitudes, where it snows out and it stays there. Okay, so in fact, it's almost a one-way trip unless you do something else. So what this gives you is not a warm, wet Mars, but a cold and icy Mars. Now, for those of you who are getting kind of depressed already, this is not <laughs> bad news, because as you see here, all of you have been to Antarctica. No mosquitoes. You can see, in fact, uh, a very strong similarity to a cross-section across the dry valleys. I've been lucky enough to have uh, spent five field seasons in Antarctica and, in fact, in the dry valleys. And you can see here, essentially, the upland stable zone, Beacon Valley in these areas and here, the coastal thaw zone and the intermediate zone in here are potentially similar kinds of things. So when we take a look at this, then, we might ask, well, what does Mars look like at these particular times? Um, if we have something like this, it is possible, even with a higher geothermal gradient, that in fact we have a global cryosphere, which is just thinner than previously. Maybe it's even melted through in some places, but it's not the warm, wet Mars uh, that we initially thought. So this brings us back then to the beautiful application. I mean, it's as if Bob knew this was coming and said, let's get these analogs together because we really want to understand the full range of activity. Because, of course, all the people who have been working in Antarctica, and of course, most of the people who are in the audience here, uh, pioneers like John Priskew, Peter Doran, Barry, Barry Lyons, who else? Barry Lyons, Diane McKnight, Chris McKay, Michael Gusev, Ross Virginia, Diana Wall, John Barrett, and Andrew Fountain, all real pioneers in this area who have been there dozens of times more than I have, practically. Um, and in fact, they are the ones that have laid the groundwork for this kind of analysis, which would be so important in the current understanding of Mars and into the future. So not just in groundwater processes, okay, where in fact we see there's an ice cemented permafrost and essentially a perched uh, aquifer, if you will, uh, and all the different kinds of analogs that we might expect on a cold and icy early Mars, uh, but also in fluvial processes. This is really, really important. All the kinds of things that Diane and others have talked about here, uh, where in fact with this cold and icy Mars, we might see in fact a variation on a theme that is, uh, that is much more like what we see in Antarctica than we previously thought. And of course, lacustrine processes. I mean, this is really going to be a gold mine for our understanding of what's going on. So this is all good news. And the question is, you know, what do we do from here? How do we take a look at this and try to understand what's going on on Mars? And in fact, it's well known that it is not the mean annual temperature in Antarctica that's critical to water mobility, but the peak seasonal temperature. And in fact, in the upper parts, the peak daytime temperature is what causes the melting. So in fact, we need to think about what's the analog for early Mars? If this is a stable environment, does anything ever happen? And what's the equivalent of a peak seasonal or peak daytime temperature to cause melting? Well, we've done some experiments on this uh, global climate model. Is this what, in fact, Milwaukee and Mars looks like? Uh, is this something where, in fact, icy highlands and the icy, uh, uh, cold and icy Mars uh, is just simply frozen wasteland with no activity? Well, of course, we have all the evidence for those valley networks for the open basin lakes and the closed basin lakes. And so what we've done is experiments in which we've asked the question, what kinds of things would in fact modify the surface? What kinds of events? And of course we have a couple, things we hopefully don't have to worry about in Antarctica, which is incoming meteorites, okay? They stay up on the, uh, the snow and get out of the way and they come in very uh, small uh, doses, but on early Mars it's quite different. You can actually change the atmosphere and warm the atmosphere globally. The second thing is that at the transition to the Hesperian, we also have huge volumes of lava that are coming out, so you have input into the atmosphere, and so we have several different types of things in addition to spin axis orbital perturbations, which can cause the equivalent of the seasonal to daily peak temperatures that we see in Antarctica, but for the globe as a whole. 
So let's just ask the question, what happens if one or more of these things happen at some time in the history of Mars? If we have a volcanic eruption, for example, that raises the median of temperature by a few degrees up to above freezing, uh, then in fact, we would produce melting of this to produce the valley networks. This is the map of the valley networks. They're very highly correlated to the distribution of ice as this model predicts. But what about the open basin lakes? Those are the red spots here where these things are draining into, and indeed the closed basin lakes shown in green are similar to that. So what we have here then is a new environment. We don't know whether this is correct or not, but it's totally testable. And in fact, we have all this information from all the key workers who have been working in this field for decades at our disposal to try to address this question. And so in summary then, it's uh, almost as if Bob Wharton had actually foreseen all this and in fact laid this groundwork so that when we come up with these new models, Antarctica is there waiting to help answer these questions. And where will we go? It's not a mistake that Bob Wharton was in fact at NASA uh, from 1989 to 1991 when a huge amount of information was put together to design the Mars Exploration Program, the Vice President's Task Force and all these other things in which he was involved. And in fact, that is today why we have all this robust Mars program. And if you take a look here then at the Curiosity Mars Science Laboratory exploration of Gale Crater, it is in fact a closed basin lake right at the margins of all these deposits. And as you know, as was discussed previously, we're gonna explore that very age of the terrain that will distinguish between these various models. So we're on the way, it's a clear legacy from Bob Wharton and all his activity. And if he's looking <coughs> down on us from above, I'm sure, I'm sure he'd be very happy with the, in fact, consequences of all the work that he's done and the legacy that it's produced. And it's all about the future for all you young people. There's so many unresolved questions that we need all the help we could get in both planetary and terrestrial studies. Thank you very much. Time for one quick question, if there's anything. Uh, what about the orographic effects of something like Olympus Mons? Do you expect that there would have been a different climate locally around that? And maybe, I don't know, the biological equivalent of, you know, some kind of ecological rainforest near there? Or uh, yeah, rainforest, did you say? Well, I mean, that's <laughs> no, no, uh, no, no I, I, it's a very good question, and you're absolutely right. And we're looking at mesoscale models of the distribution of here. And in fact, uh, a student of mine is. Uh, doing uh, mesoscale models of the distribution of the valley networks and showing orographic effects locally, and we're almost able to distinguish between the possibility of rainfall and snowfall to kind of test these models here. Absolutely right. And I showed you the hemisphere, which uh, Tharsis was not on, and the picture of Tharsis is even more unbelievable because you do have these orographic effects, a absolutely. So it's a very good question, um, and it's something we need to look into in detail in the future.